It was designed to punish. It was created to kill. It was meant to showcase earthly power on the side of a hill. It was wood and rope. It was hammer and nails. It was degradation, then death. And it never failed. It was chosen to stop the Christ, to erase the message he taught. It was the bitter end of Jesus. At least, that's what they thought. It was intended to defeat, to put down, to make the disciples give up, but instead it became the symbol of God's love. The icon of death became the icon of true living. What once marked the end is now the mark of the beginning, a mark of forgiveness, of new life, of new birth. What began at Calvary now covers the earth over cities, over hospitals, through the streets, through homes. The picture of God's sacrifice is our picture of hope, the lasting image of our Savior and salvation's great cost. This is more than a symbol. This is the cross. Hallelujah. Can somebody give him a shout of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Well, good morning, Floodgate Church. If you would stand to your feet. So good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Hallelujah. Well, if you missed out on our sunrise service this morning it was such a wonderful experience uh, it was a little bit cold a little bit early but you know i thought to myself if christ can rise from the dead then i can get myself out of bed amen <laughs> praise god well just lift your hands with me this morning heavenly father we thank you so 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 much we cannot thank you enough for what you did for us being the only man to ever live a perfect life. The only man to live a blameless life before God. Being fully God and fully man and then dying. And your blood pouring out over everybody so that we can have atonement for the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Jesus, we lift your name up today and we remember what you did on that cross, but more importantly, what you did three days later, rising from the dead, hallelujah. Jesus, we love you and we worship you and we give you all the honor, all the glory and all the praise. And we love to worship you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's worship!
Everyone needs compassion A love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations
The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake.
is glorified forever he is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive he is alive forever he is glorified forever he is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive he is
in his eyes and if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth pick a sloppy wet kiss and my heart turns violently in my chest and i don't have time to
this is all for you. God, we lift your name up. This is all for you, all our worship, God. It's for you. You're the only one worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. And we give it to you this morning. Hallelujah. Jesus, we remember what you did and we are so thankful, God. So we just say, come and have your way this morning and in our lives, God. Lord, I pray that everybody around us would feel the glow of your presence as we leave here today, God. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Somebody give them a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Well, happy Resurrection Sunday again, Floodgate. Hey, before you take your seat, give somebody a handshake or hug. Tell them they're looking fancy this morning. Well, as you guys take your seats, I just want to give you guys a warm welcome. And, and if it is your very first time here, I want you to do me a favor. There is a Connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. And we would really love to capture your visit. Um, so fill out your information. Get on our email list. We don't usually have a lot going on here at Floodgate. But uh, <laughs> I'm just playing. We got a whole lot going on. And you'll see with our announcements in a few short minutes. But even if you have prayer requests... Uh, go ahead, fill them out. They can be anonymous. You can toss your name on there. We'd love to pray with you, but get connected. We'd love to capture your visit. And then when we have offering here in a few short moments, you can go ahead and toss it right in the offering bucket. With that being said, here's some announcements. Thank you all for being here, especially our first time visitors. We're so glad that you can all gather with us today to celebrate the fact that Jesus is King, death is defeated, and the stone has been rolled away. We can't wait to celebrate all together as a family. Happy Resurrection Day. So from the outside, my life looks crazy. I was born without legs, left in the hospital, Adopted by the most unlikely couple in the middle of nowhere. I've always been obsessed with gymnastics. It was maybe crazy to have that kind of a dream without legs, but in my head, it didn't matter. From Illinois, I was raised with an empowered mindset, self-esteem, confidence, you can do anything you want. I played softball, basketball, volleyball, and power tumbling, all against able-bodied athletes. Fast forward a couple years, I started performing as an acrobat and an aerialist all over the world. It's just unbelievable and I couldn't be more grateful. Is happiness a choice? Yes. I have to make decisions every day to be happy. It doesn't matter that I was born without legs, not given a name, left in the hospital. Those circumstances that look ugly on the outside are actually what was the beginning of my beauty.
Hi everyone, Clara here. I want to invite everyone to our spring session of Bible study coming up on April the 11th. That'll be for the men on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. and the women Thursdays at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. The women will be doing a new study on the book of John by Melissa Spolstra. And at the same time, the men will be studying a book called Fight by Craig Rochelle. For more information, go to floodgatechurch.com slash events. There you will find a link to purchase your books online and also you can register for the study. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. In divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep. So I wanted to invite you out to a worship night that we are hosting here at Floodgate Church on April 14th, starting at 6 p.m. This is something we've never done before, so we are really believing for a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. So I want you to come with expectant hearts and also to bring a friend, bring a family member ages 18 through 35 as we sing and lift up praises to our King. And it is the cross where your misery ends. It is at the cross where your agony ends. It is at the cross where the devil says, I'm done with you. There's no more I can do here. and then the tail, and slowly dismantle the body with my teeth. <laughs> Can you say what your favorite candy is? No? <laughs> say M&M's. <laughs> What's your favorite part of Easter? 
Oh, knowing that Jesus died and rose for my sins. Amen. And what's your favorite candy? Oh, peanut m and m My favorite too. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. All right. What's your favorite part of Easter? Man, just like my mother-in-law, I'm just so thankful that Jesus died for just everybody and that his, his blood just atoned for all of our sin and that he rose again on Easter Sunday. Yeah. Now what's your favorite candy? Oh man, that's a tough one. Favorite candy, I guess I'd have to go with the Heath Bar. Maybe a little bit of Reese's. Yeah, I like Reese's too. <laughs> I like both of your answers. Yeah! yeah. Stay in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What a sacrifice was made As the heavens
Amen. All hell, King Jesus. All hell, King Jesus. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Floodgate, please stand with me as we prepare for the reception of our morning's tithes and offerings. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? All the time. All the time. And let me also um, just add something really quick about this week. This is Holy Week. At Floodgate, we call it Busy Week. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not stopping this, uh, this coming Wednesday. Please mark your calendars. Come out and join us for, uh, for uh, Jen uh, Bricker-Bauer. She has an amazing story. Uh, there, a part of it that they don't talk about or she doesn't in the videos is she is a world-class gymnast and aerialist. But she met, th this is really a crazy part about the story, in doing her gymnastics, she meets other gymnasts and other people who, uh, who do what she does. And she met someone who is a gold medal winner for the United States. And the two of them, when they met, they looked at each other and they're like, you look like me. I look like you. When she was abandoned in the hospital by her parents, they didn't name her. They didn't claim her. They didn't want anything to do with her. They just left her and said, adopt her. Her sister is a gold medalist. Who has legs. Her sister without legs became this world-class gymnast an aerialist. They met in a meet and found out they were actually sisters. It is a powerful story. And we have the privilege of having her with us. Please come and join us. You will be blessed. It is just a cool story. And I apologize for anyone who is disappointed that General Flynn won't be here with us. I need to let you know why, um, if you haven't heard. We wound up getting an FYI a couple weeks ago from his office, and the person who was his publicist and controller of a number of things sent out a message to all the pastors who have churches that were hosting him and said, for your information, we need to let you know there's been a little pushback about the film, and here's the reason why. Uh, there are six bombs that are dropped in the movie. You know, the, the bad word. Uh, with 20 times where the Lord's name is taken in vain. And a bunch of other minor words in the movie. Is that going to be a problem? And then they said that they were thinking about putting out a version that had that all that was extracted out or beeped or whatever. And I emailed back and said, we have to have that or it's no go here. Yeah. And apparently they dropped every church that was going to host the movie that objected. And we're one of the ones that objected. I'm really disappointed. I was looking forward to meeting him and, and screening, uh, presenting the documentary for the very first time. It's really a disappointment, but... We can't do that in good conscience with me understanding and knowing that that's, you know, whatever you say on your own, outside of the walls, I don't know if I'm going to say that's fine, but, you know, uh, that's different. Here with us knowing can't do it, you know, so at any rate, that's where we're at on that. So just so you know, and it's just the way it is. And for whoever needs to hear that, but he is, he will not be here, but we do have a revival coming. Yeah. We have a tent coming. Yeah. And we had a, a meeting on Tuesday with the, with the team that puts it on. 
and they let everyone know this. So this is not a hidden thing for these events that have the 5,000 tent team. A lot of politicians show up, including someone with the, with the initials DT. Um, he, he shows up at these tent events on occasion. You never know. He just might drop in. We might see a helicopter coming down <laughs> on our parking lot. <laughs> And I'll have, if, if he does, I'll have to tell him, you know, I was rooting for the other guy, but last man standing, you've got my vote. <laughs> so, so at any rate, uh, that, just, that actually might happen. And I know he wants to win Michigan, and you just never know. He may wind up showing up. <laughs> Absolutely, but... We're not going to go there right now. I just thought I'd, I just thought I'd let, you guys, uh, let you guys know that. Now, on to our business. It is time for us to receive the morning's tithes and offerings. I know I already said it, but you can do it again. All right. Join me in prayer and proclamation. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you on this Resurrection Sunday that we can give you glory and honor, and that we can reflect on the power of your presence of what you did for us, my God in dying for our sin, in raising for us to have life. And so Jesus, on this resurrection commemoration day, we honor you and we bless you. And we, your people, as we walk in obedience, Lord, it is our, our desire, Father, to fully lay our lives down. And so, Lord, in every way, have your way. We bring our tithe and offering to lay at your feet to bless you with that portion of that which you have given us custody over. Back to you, my God. We thank you that all of our income, that all of our substance comes from you. Father, we bring this portion back to lay at your feet in honor of what you've done for us. And so, Jesus, even now, we bless the tithe and the offering. We bless those who are so generous, my God, and who are so willing to trust you in every aspect and every way of life. We bless them in Jesus' mighty name. And, Father, we declare and decree over your sons and daughters that they will walk under the mantle of your covering and that you will show them, Lord, how you are the provider of all we have need of as we walk in obedience to you. We declare and decree, my God, that all of your people's needs will be met according to the riches of glory of your Son, my God. We declare and we decree in Jesus' name that God will supply us abundantly with seed and bread to eat, seed to sow and bread to eat, Lord, in this year. We declare and we decree in Jesus' name that all of our seed that we sow will be blessed and multiply and yield great increase. We decree and we declare that, Father, that your goodness would be made manifest and that we would see your name glorified. So now, Father, we bless your sons and daughters. We give you glory for all that you're doing in our midst. Amen and amen. Floodgate, you can release your tithes and offerings at this time. good, isn't he? Oh, well, friends, 
Oh, and worship team, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Yeah. The only thing that would have been better, Dave, this is directed at you. You should have did it with your teeth. <laughs> And then set your guitar on fire afterwards. <laughs> ah, yes, for fire night. <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, friends, I just want to encourage you um, not to take the bait of the bait and switch that is happening in the news right now. Um, as many of us know, our illustrious president has declared that March 31st um, that is a, there is a different focus from his perspective. But this March 31st, we are focusing on Jesus. And we are not blaspheming the Lord in any way, shape, or form. And even though the majority of the Christian population is a little disturbed about it, regardless of what the leader of the free world says, it is not Trans Visibility Day. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday is non-transferable. This is the day our Messiah rose from the dead that we celebrate. Jesus became visible beyond the grave. This holiday is the most historically verified holiday of any celebration in the world. That is what today is. And it's an astonishing, astonishing holiday, the greatest miracle in the world. That happened on this day. The most provable holiday in history happened on this day. And for that reason, we will not allow a blasphemous statement from our government's administration to distract from this celebration in any way, shape, or form. There's your headline news. Hallelujah. All right, let's talk about a wrinkle in time. I know that last Sunday I said that we were done with our series on Galatians, but I thought I would surprise you and take one last dip Galatians 4, 4, and 5, and I know we talked about it last week a little bit, but last week was Palm Sunday. Today is Resurrection Sunday. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's a powerful statement. And it's one that encapsulates our faith. You know, our, our faith, the celebration of Resurrection Sunday has been under siege for a long time. A friend of mine from Bible college, an old, old buddy from the dinosaur days, was rudely confronted with our society's position concerning the prophetic challenge of Resurrection Sunday at a hallmark a number of years ago. His name is Dave Jeffries, you, and on occasion, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see us bannering back and forth, really good friend. We went to Bible college in Santa Cruz back in the 80s, and he went into Hallmark looking for a religious sympathy card to no avail. He asked for help, and this is what he said happened to him. I went to Hallmark, and the manager asked me if I needed any help, as they saw him looking all over the store. Said, I'm looking for encouragement cards, something spiritual. Oh, that's a problem, she replied. We removed everything spiritual to make room for Easter. <laughs> Seriously, this really happened to my buddy. <laughs> and that's what you call ironic. It's what I call a problem. Because in a moment... In a wrinkle of time, we're trying to forget why we are and what can happen to us. But in a moment, in a wrinkle of time, 
we can meet the one who has brought us to where we are and bring us into fullness. First thing I want to draw your attention to this morning is three wrinkles in time. There are three moments in time that determine all history, in my opinion. These moments are powerful. Their importance is evidenced by the fact that everywhere on this planet, people acknowledge these three moments. Whether in faith or not is immaterial. Each moment has impacted history in the most profound of ways. Everyone acknowledges Christmas. Now, internally, we may fight over the day or say, well, it's, that one isn't the one you should look at, but it doesn't matter. Everyone in the world acknowledges Christmas. God stepped into the human arena, and in one moment, in a wrinkle in time, we see our calendar divided into before Christ and after death. B.C. and A.D. It is suddenly, in a moment, God impacted the planet in that moment and everyone observes what transpired. Everyone recognizes the cross. People all over the earth at least understand that the cross is a sign of rescue and mercy. We know that. That's why you go into any major city, you will find a rescue mission. And on that rescue mission will be a cross with letters, Jesus saves. You know, I'm a California expat, or most of you know that. My wife and I fled the state a number of years ago. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I remember years ago, this is something most people don't realize, but California gets earthquakes. Everyone knows that. But they also get tornadoes. Every type of disaster you can think of happens there. That's why there's so many disaster movies about California. This one year... A freak tornado hit where they normally do not hit. A tornado actually set down in downtown Los Angeles. Seriously. It wasn't the plot of a movie. A real tornado hit. It knocked down a bunch of buildings. It was strong enough to knock them to the ground. There was a picture. The front page of the San Francisco Chronicle the next day. One building standing with the two next to it on the ground. The building was the rescue mission. The Los Angeles rescue mission. And on top of it, right in the middle of the picture, was Jesus saves. It was a great image. The cross is a sign of rescue and of mercy. It is one that cries out, it is finished. And in that one moment of time, in that wrinkle, provision was made, full provision for our rescue of finished forgiveness, able to cover everyone's sin, whoever will accept God's offer of mercy. And everyone also rec recognizes Easter. We recognize resurrection. Hundreds of millions of people gather today all around the world to acknowledge that one wrinkle in time, not transgender day, but the day when an earthquake shook and the stone rolled back, disclosing the fact that he is not there. He's risen. Heaven invaded earth. The resurrection isn't poetry. It is physical reality. Jesus is alive. That one moment in time, that wrinkle changed everything. All of history altered because of this moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 3 through 8. In Luke 24, 33 and 34 read like this. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Paul saying, I had to receive the same message you did. And it changed me. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. Now this wasn't 500 people spread out over weeks. He appeared to 500 people and preached to them Jesus, the resurrected Lord. Between resurrection and ascension. Of whom, when Paul is writing, the greater part remained to the present. He was saying, look, we have almost 500 witnesses that are still alive that saw Jesus. If you don't believe me, look him up on Facebook. <laughs> but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. You know, Paul who saw him on the road to Damascus and was blinded by the light. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were with them gathering together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he had known, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Friends, our faith is built on. It rests on the foundation of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is founded on a witnessed, documented, historical event. This is not a fable or the imagination of a religious community. It is not the story of resuscitation where someone comes back for a moment. No. This is a celebration of resurrection. And not just a resurrection, but a resurrection of one who returned to live forevermore. Forever resurrected so that we, we will live in the same exact way. See, again, the resurrection is based on reliable testimony by people who were reliable witnesses. When Paul made this statement, he was saying, look, you can, you can go out and find these people. They will tell you Jesus is alive. They will tell you he rose from the dead. They will tell you I saw him. Some can even say I put my fingers in the holes in his hands and in his side. And even though he suffered wounds that should have killed him, he is alive and well. You see, the basis for the historical fact of our understanding of resurrection is demonstrated by that credibility and number of post-resurrection witnesses. This wasn't just the 11 who remained with one replacing the one who betrayed Jesus. As many as 500 in one occasion with a whole bunch of others. These witnesses had no reason to die for what they believed to be true if it wasn't. without consideration of its content. Here's another thing that I think is really important. And by the way, we're going to look at this further next week as we start a new series. So I'm not gonna keep going back to Galatians. The Bible has been proven 
by secular historians to be an authentic document of antiquity. It is the most proven document of antiquity, by far. Scholars of ancient literature agree, even if they don't agree with the conclusion that Jesus is God. They agree that the Bible is the most un, or the most powerful book ever written, that it is the most reliable, unchanged document passed down from ancient history. We can look at the, at the targums, the little pieces that continue to exist, or the full manuscripts, and know that it has not changed. It hasn't been altered. It is reality. It is something that, that unlike any other document in history related to religious matters, it has not changed. And it doesn't exalt the, the benefactors or the, 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 the different people that are identified in it except for one. And that's Jesus. Jesus. You see, this is why we celebrate. History has been applied to now. Jesus rose from the dead. He verified his claims as Savior for our sin and as being the Son of God, giving us eternal life. Jesus is alive today and forevermore, and he promises to meet us in the same way today, today, now, and tomorrow, and every day until he returns. It's a pretty powerful truth. See, this is what we call a transforming wrinkle, a moment in time. I want to challenge you to become like those 500. Choose to become a spokesperson for truth. To tell people that what we believe is not fictitious, it's not a fable, it is founded on reality, and we can prove it. That's right. After his post-resurrection encounter with Jesus, Peter, who like General Flynn, liked to... Drop bombs every now and then. <laughs> he was a sailor, a fisherman. He had salty language. That Peter became a transformed man. Even though he saw miracles and was able to participate. I mean, I love the story of Peter. Peter's the guy that kept falling down and getting up. He was like a, he was like a weevil. <laughs> Wobbled all over the place, but refused to stay down. Pop him back up over and over and over. This is the guy that saw Jesus multiply bread and fish. He saw Jesus call Lazarus out of a tomb. And he watched Lazarus. I mean, can you imagine what he must have looked like? He would have been all wrapped up like a mummy. Sure, I am, Jesus. Probably took 10 minutes to get from where he was laid to get, out, to get outside. Well, someone please <laughs> unwrap me. He saw that. He also, when their boat was sinking, and Jesus wasn't with them in the middle of a major storm. They thought they were going to die. He sees Jesus strolling along on top of the waves. Him and his buzz go, there's a ghost. Oh, that's it, man. We're dead. We're already seeing the ghost. When Peter recognizes this Jesus, and Jesus says, come on, come over here, not me to you, you come to me. He jumps out of the boat and he's walking on water. It's pretty, that's, that's Peter. And of course, his faith started to waver and he sunk. You can almost hear him say, help me, help me, I'm shrieking. Help me. 
Jesus takes him by the hand and lifts him up. The coolest thing about that story is Peter didn't walk on water once. He walked twice because Jesus lifts him up in his moment of doubt, sets him back on top of the water, and they finish their little excursion. That should be a message for every one of us that has struggled and had complications or whatever else. Jesus doesn't give up on you. Peter, instead of stumbling out of a miracle with uncertain, unstable steps like what happened in the water, from the moment that he met the resurrected Lord at the side of the lake, when he was barbecuing fish and Jesus shows up and just tells him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Well, actually, third time he says, do you like me? Do you at least like me? Go feed my sheep. He says, all right. I really love you and I'll do it. From that moment on, from his commissioning, Peter, instead of walking with instability, began to walk with miracles happening at his hand, not just observing them at the Messiah's hand. In Acts 5, 15, 9, 34, and 40, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he rose immediately. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed and turned to the body. He said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. She was dead. No longer. But friends, millions have found that Jesus, his resurrected life can provide answers, can provide presence, can provide power, can provide what we need at our moment of need, where we are at, whether or not we have it or not. You see... Jesus doesn't shun people no matter how well they started or how poorly they ended. That is the story of our faith. He loves us. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. See, Jesus, he will come for anyone at any time. Paul was born outside the circle of Jesus' earthly ministry. But inside the span of Paul's need for him, Jesus showed up at that critical moment and he changed. This is why Paul writes, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. In the same way that Paul was born out of due time, every single one of us here, Everyone who names the name of Jesus. We were all born out of due time. We, we believe without seeing him. We believe without putting our fingers in the holes in his hands or in the hole in his side. We believe because our God has proven to be accurate and true. He has transformed our lives. He's changed our hearts. He's given us his presence. He's given us his power. And we know that Jesus is alive. Every one of us who was born out of due time. We know that in the fullness of time, in this time that God planned, he sent his son by a miracle birth so that no one would mistake that he was not an ordinary person and that in his dying that, we would, that he would reconcile himself to us. No one, no one. This has not happened to anyone. There is only one sinless person, Jesus. To attribute that to anyone else is to, is to detract from the power of the message of God redeeming us. Only Jesus. Only Jesus, only Jesus. 
He is the Savior. He and he alone. See, every one of us, we're distant from him in one way or another. His half-brothers and sisters, his own mother. As blessed as Mary is, honored, she doubted her son's message in ministry. She did. There was a point in time where she thought that Jesus had kind of went cuckoo, cuckoo. She gathered her family together. They approached Jesus quietly. And scripture says to take him away quietly. That is a euphemism. A Greek euphemism for we're bringing the rubber jacket. He needs to go on vacation. He needs to rest. He's taken this thing a little too far. He believes it a little too much. We don't want him to die for, what, for what's happening. And then he died and rose again. And for them, everything changed. See, all of us need to be drawn back into that intimate relationship with Father God, into his family as sons and daughters. That's what Galatians 4, 4 and 5 is all about. There is none righteous, no, not one. No one except Jesus. God wants us to walk in the certainty of our relationship with him and out of that, be at peace with one another. Understanding that our peace, our peace is based on our peace with God. And our peace with God is what gives us the ability to be at peace with others. To be reconciled as we find ourselves in him. You see, our peace isn't based on our lack of conflict. Our peace is based on us acknowledging Jesus in the pivotal moments that are transformational. This is what the fullness of time is all about. This is what happens from Christ's cradle to the empty tomb, from Christ's cradle to the mountaintop, from Christ's cradle to the ascension, from Christ's cradle to the day that he returns for us in glory to call ourselves to him for the second coming to happen and for him to reconcile all of creation with him, with his purpose, with his desire, bringing us back to first intent to what we were supposed to be but lost in the fall. You see, we need the hope that comes from our Savior. The knowledge that God is giving someone to meet me where I am at my deepest point of need. Jesus. Every time. You see, this is a wrinkle of time that provides hope to the hopeless. Has anyone here ever needed hope? The best way, the best way to see hope addressed is to acknowledge the excellence of God's offer of hope. You see, today is given to win every tomorrow. That's the power of Resurrection Sunday. Today was given to win every tomorrow. Today is given to win every tomorrow. So we honor the moment when God provided our Savior. You see, this is what God says about our times of hopelessness. He gave us a moment of truth where three words were spoken. It 
is finished. You see, that's the excellence of God's offer of help in our need for hope. All guilt, all bondage can be broken. Honor the moment, the wrinkle in time. That provides forgiveness and release. Jesus, in that glorious moment, the stone rolls away. Gloriously rolls away. In the exhaustion of life, the wrinkle happens. I love what Matthew records in the second and the sixth verse, and behold, there was a great earthquake. I'll tell you, great earthquakes. If someone says it was a great earthquake, and they're from Israel or California, trust them. Because if you grow up around earthquakes, yeah, most earthquakes are, yeah. You, know, you feel a five pointer, five one, five two, five three in the middle of the night. You know, your bed's moving a little bit. You're hearing things rattle. Something might, if you didn't properly secure it, it might fall down and break. You feel a little vertigo. It's like, what's going on here? This is gone. Ah, just an earthquake. You roll over, go back to sleep. Anyone who lived in California, grew up in California, it's just the way it is. But every now and then, those earthquakes, there'll be, a, there'll be a good earthquake. I remember in Bible college, my friend David Jeffries, this one time I was in, in taking voice lessons to be able to sing. <laughs> it's my college. It had a big section, uh, section for musicians and worship leaders and all that including voice lessons, and I signed up for a class too. I did. After a few weeks, my professor pulled me aside and said, you know, you might want to consider dropping this class because I'm going to have to fail you. I said, oh, come on, don't do that. He said, well, what, what? <laughs> I'm serious. He goes, I don't understand why you're taking this class. You can't sing. <laughs> He really told me that. He goes, you're horrible. <laughs> he said, I don't think we can train you, and I've trained a lot of people. Why do you want to stay in this class? And I said, oh, because I read that, that as a preacher, you want to take vocal lessons like what a singer does so that you can learn how to breathe properly so you don't damage your, your vocal cords in preaching. So you learn how to breathe from your diaphragm instead of, uh, in, instead of just speaking. He goes, oh, is that why you're here? I said, yeah, I know I can't sing. He goes, okay, I'm going to grade you on a different, on, on a different basis. <laughs> but I'm not going to make you publicly sing in front of all the other students. <laughs> I'm serious, that really happened to me. <laughs> so... This one day, the, the class was in, in an upstairs room in the gymnasium. So it's about three, maybe four stories up above the base of the ground. And, and it's surrounded by redwoods because this is in Santa Cruz in the mountains. Redwood trees everywhere. We're looking out the window. And our professor was from Wisconsin. He'd never been in a big earthquake. And he told us that he was kind of... Looking forward to one, but kind of panicked, right? So we're looking out the window, and all of a sudden, it sounds like a freight train's coming. And that's what earthquakes do. It sounds like a freight train is coming down the tracks. As we're looking out the window, the redwood trees are going like this, and they're moving closer and closer to us. All of a sudden, it hits, boom! The, the building starts going up and down. He screams, runs down the stairs outside, and would never go back to class again. 
And that was just a good earthquake. Now, a great earthquake, 1989, Loma Prieta. The one where bridges fell down, or if you were watching the World Series, it was interrupted. That was a great earthquake. And it was scary. When it hit, I was watching, watching the opening of the World Series, and this ground started shaking, eh. And then it really started shaking. I'm like, oh. And then it really started shaking. I'm like, I better get out of here. I tried to get up out of my chair. It knocked me down. I tried to get up again. It knocked me down. I couldn't move. That's a great earthquake. So here, Matthew says, a great earthquake. Trust a Jew, an Israeli Jew, who says a great earthquake, because they live with earthquakes. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came. And check this out. This is so cool. And rolled the stone back. This great earthquake happens because the angel comes down. Heaven intersects earth. This angel comes as he rolls the stone. Boom, this earthquake happens and everyone knows it. Because the power of resurrection invades that tomb. Scripture says that dead people who had recently died, the, the power of resurrection was so great, they rose up and started walking. That's a great earthquake. That's a great resurrection. When we're resurrected, mountains are going to split. Every eye will behold him as we are reconnected. If we're dead with our body, and if we're alive in the twinkling of an eye, these bodies that were sown in corruption, these bodies that have all kinds of messed up things with them, will instantaneously be made perfect. And we will meet him in the air to be with him forever. That's why we celebrate. Rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it and said, he is not here for he is risen. And he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Not where he's laying, where he lay. Friends, Jesus rising from the dead verifies that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus' resurrection sets him apart from every other religious leader or human being. He is unique on purpose. So if you're here and you're looking for more there is so much more. more. The Lord offers us a life of abundance that began in one wrinkle, one moment in time. When Jesus rose from the dead, it opened the floodgates of heaven. So the life flow of the Savior could fill each one of us to overflowing, overwhelming us with his goodness, with his grace, with his mercy. And by his spirit, the living God comes to us when we are open to him and acknowledge him and fills us and empowers us and allows us to be like those 500, a witness that says Jesus is alive. He's living forevermore. And if you trust him, so will you. See, once we know him, we can depend on him. We can walk in the changed atmosphere of heaven as he breathes into our souls that had been polluted by the atmosphere of this world. You see, Jesus comes to every one of us to say, resurrection life is for you if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, 
he will quicken your mortal body. That's the message of the cross of the empty tomb. And yet many people don't understand the cross or their need for it, and they will blaspheme the day that we celebrate. Pray for those people. That they come into the awareness that someone had to pay for the penalty of our sin, theirs and mine. You see, there's no rescue if I'm the one who's paying for it because I'm the one who did it. If someone pays it for me, the sin that requires death, he has to be God for no one could pay the debt and live if he wasn't. So Calvary is a message of forgiveness and a message of responsibility. It's a message that brings us into proper understanding that Jesus is Savior. But often people don't understand that the cross is the symbol of death. When the cross is applied to our lives, it means death to our old ways and ourselves and that we are to follow him daily in the light of the revelation of the cross. This is the power of the transformed life. This is Jesus addressing the finale for sin. Sin is whatever stains, whatever drains, whatever destroys your life. He came to be the answer. Sin is what creeps in and makes us less than what we know we should be. And that wrinkle in time where it is finished, was shouted, makes it possible for you and me to finish well. To be freed from whatever traps, whatever obstructs. Because Jesus put an end to the power of sin. To free us from guilt. To liberate us and make us whole. So when we come to terms with the cross and the empty tomb, with what he accomplished back then, that has all the ability to smash into the moment of our present and free us, he finishes the hold of evil wherever it is in our lives. When we submit ourselves to him and say, Jesus, Jesus, I'll trust you. I will honor you. I welcome you. Jesus. So friends, as we conclude this morning, let me challenge you. Acknowledge the excellence of God's offer. That wrinkle in time that breathes life. A life that touches now and forever. And for us to know and understand that God never loses patience with people who try to walk in a miracle and even slides back or falls down or slips under the water, says the wrong things or outright denies him. Jesus loves his children. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. And so I ask you, have you walked with Jesus? 
you begun to walk on water? Learning what it means to walk in a miracle and then become overwhelmed by a situation or circumstance and begin to sink? Trust Jesus to lift you up. Maybe you've never known a walk with Christ, but you tried to do the right thing only to find out that you ended up being dragged down when you tried to walk above things. That's you, find Jesus. Or maybe, maybe your tongue has become a sword in the hand of Satan. And your tongue has been used to steal, to kill, and destroy others. where you've spoken about the glorious things of God. And later, said hideous, destructive things. Hideous. Like bowing in marriage till death to his part and then later saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you. That's a hideous thing. If that's happened to you on either end, if you has spoken of his glory only to speak otherwise. Hear me on this. Find Jesus. Let him direct your conversation. Let him touch what you say, what you speak. Let him be your all in all. Find forgiveness. Find Jesus. It's just like Peter. All of us have faced our own cowardice when the chips were down. When things aren't right, when they're not good. And people look at us and say, hey, look how messed up your life is right now. Look what you did. You call yourself a Christian? Even if you responded by cursing and running into the darkness, find Jesus. Better yet, as he finds you in your doldrums as you're barbecuing fish, wondering what you need to do, what can I do? Let his grace and mercy bring restoration to your life find Jesus. He is bigger than your worst day and he's greater than your best day. Find Jesus. You may not have denied Jesus. Maybe you didn't stand up for him. Find him. You see, there's one moment in time, one wrinkle where we get the opportunity of launching our life with Jesus. And if we fail, there's one moment in time, one wrinkle where Jesus says, I'll take you by the hand and lift you back up. And then you wind up cursing him out. There's one moment, one wrinkle in time where he comes and finds you wherever you're hiding. He says, don't you really love me? Don't you really love me? And he says, come, follow me, feed my sheep. This is Jesus. His grace is overwhelming. His ever-present power and love is overwhelming. Let him into the deepest recesses of your life. If you've never known the Lord, understand. Jesus says that all of us would one day stand before the Father. He said in Matthew 10, 32, if you acknowledge me now before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father in heaven. Have you acknowledged Jesus? In the 14th chapter of John in the sixth verse, he says, he that comes to me, I'll never turn away. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
if you know him, but you struggled. He will never turn away from you. He will be there for you in your worst of moments and in your greatest. He will always be there. This is our Savior. But if you've never met him, acknowledge Christ who rose from the dead. Understand he came to give you the breath of life to take you from darkness into light, to forgive you that you can have a new life. That's what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. Life everlasting can be your gift, just like it's mine. In August, 1977, I met Jesus. My, not, my life has never been the same. Have I started to sink under the waves? Yeah, on a few occasions. Have I ever messed up? You bet I have, because I'm just like everyone else. But his hand was always there. His grace was always there. His mercy was always there. And it'll be there for you. Amen? I want you to stand to your feet. Now I want you to turn to your neighbors and just quickly ask them, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Now ask them another question. Do you need Jesus' intervention of forgiveness? Go ahead, ask him. Do you need Jesus to intervene? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need forgiveness? Now ask him one more question. Do you need the power of God Do you need more? Go ahead, ask them, ask your neighbor, do you need more? If they've never met Jesus, here's your opportunity to lead someone to Christ. If they need forgiveness, here's your opportunity to pray them into a right standing. And if they need more, Here's your opportunity to watch the power and the glory of God to come down. So whatever your neighbor responded, they responded that they needed something, turn to them right now, lay your hand on their forehead and let them have it. You think I'm kidding? Go for it. <laughs> Now I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. If in any way that was your response, you need to meet Jesus, you need to have something broken off of you, or you just need more, here's your opportunity to come for us to join our faith with yours to see the goodness of heaven break forth. You need healing? There's a whole bunch of people that keep getting healed around this place. We can't seem to stop it. We say more. You need forgiveness. We'll walk you through that path. You need mercy, you need grace. You just need more. Come down to be prayed for. Let the goodness of heaven break forth. And for everyone else and everyone here, happy Resurrection Sunday. We love you. Love Jesus. Love him greatly. Love him more. And we'll see you Wednesday.